And um, each month, the Care Patrol team brings together an, an expert to help us uh, help our clients, help our loved ones, help ourselves better uh, during these challenging times. And uh, today, our speaker is Dr. Asante Dixon. But before we meet Dr. Dixon, I want to go through some housekeeping and introduce you to the Care Patrol team. So uh, the first thing that you need to know is, is that is sort of how to make your experience the best it can be here in this Zoom meeting. What we do is uh, in chat is how you can interact with the other attendees. And today we've got over 125 people that have registered for this event. So there's, there's the potential for a lot of interaction. And uh, the, um, the, the other attendees can be just as great of a resource as our speaker and the care patrol team. So um, be sure to utilize chat. And what's important though, when you're using chat is to make sure you use the drop down menu that says all panelists and attendees. Uh, that way everybody can see your message and know who you are. And uh, so just make sure you use that drop down menu that you see on the screen there before you put your chat message in. The second thing that we wanna make you aware of is, is that we love to make these, these presentations interactive. So you can ask Dr. Dixon uh, questions, you can make comments, and you can do that two, one of two ways. You can type in your question right when it pops into your head uh, as Dr. Dixon is speaking, and we'll make sure to get to it. Or um, when we sort of open the floor up for questions and answers, you can click that raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and we'll call on you and you can ask your question verbally. And don't worry if your hair and makeup isn't perfect, we're just gonna hear your voice. We're not gonna see you on uh, the video camera. And that's for everybody in the audience, whatever you're doing out there, we can't see you. This is a webinar, Zoom webinar format, not a regular Zoom format. So don't worry about your camera popping on or your audio popping on throughout the event today. And the, the last thing that I like to mention to people is in the upper right hand corner, you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view to see what you like best, okay? And um, also all of the, the windows on your Zoom screen can be minimized or maximized just by clicking on them. So if the conversation is going on in chat and you find that distracting, just click on that window and it should disappear. All right, well, um, uh, with that, what I wanna do is first introduce you to the Care Patrol team. And so if our Care Patrol team members can unmute and start their video, um, we can uh, introduce you to the audience here. And I believe while everybody is uh, turning on their cameras, Paula, did you wanna tell us a little bit about Care Patrol? Well, actually, Steve, I think Cindy's going oh, to. Oh, sorry, I, I get so confused. That's uh, okay, no I, problem. I, let's see, let's get, uh, um, let's, I'm, I'm trying to get everybody's video on, but if uh, Cindy, when you get yours on, if you want to just uh, tell us about yourself and and introduce and tell us a little bit about uh, Care Patrol. Oh, Steve, it's saying that um, the host has blocked my video. Can you turn oh. me on? Oh, no, I didn't right. mean to do that. Uh, That's okay. And uh, maybe it's better. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. Cindy, you look so good today. No way. <laughs> all right. Hi, thanks for joining us, everybody. We're excited to have all of you here. I'm Cindy Yar Evans, the owner of the Baltimore Annapolis Border Franchise. I have part of Baltimore County and, and mostly Anne Arundel County. But um, just to give you a sense of what we do, if you don't know about us already, we help seniors find safe uh, senior living. That is at no charge to the client. And typically that's um, mostly assisted living and memory care. 
and we're local and we're very hands-on. So our process is to understand the seniors' uh, clinical needs um, today and in the future and what they like to do, where they wanna live and, and also evaluate their financial capabilities so that we're recommending appropriate places. Um, I've been called more than once a matchmaker since we were matching these safe communities to our clients' needs. Um, and the reason we're successful is because we understand that all of the community's capabilities, their staffing ratios, their amenities, and we also review all the state deficiency surveys. So we know that we're recommending safe places. Um, since Care Patrol places so many people, we have real life experience with understanding the care capabilities for our clients. And even during um, this pandemic, we've been arranging tours. Sometimes that's in person and we that the goal is in person because I think you get a better sense of it, but some because of restrictions of COVID are being done virtually. Um, so we, we assist the senior and their families through the entire process until they're placed. Um, and just to give you a sense of our experience, we've placed over 3000 clients in almost a um, thousand different communities. So I, we believe that our goal at Care Patrol, our most important role is to advocate for the seniors um, and their families in which we serve. And I think that um, Steve is gonna now let everybody else introduce themselves. Yeah, yeah, so this is always fun. It feels like you're in the Brady, on the Brady Bunch. So, uh, and there's Cindy now down at the bottom, like, uh, <laughs> but, but so I guess let's go to to my left uh, and and start off with Paula. Thanks, Steve. Hi, I'm Paula Sotier. Um, I'm the owner of Care Patrol Baltimore, except the parts that Cindy has, as well as we cover Hartford. And honestly, I can't be more excited about today. Um, I'm really looking forward to Dr. Dixon talking about how stress affects the brain. Honestly, for me personally, and then hopefully for my seniors. Great. And then uh, under uh, Paula, we got Rhonda Thomas. Hi, my name is Rhonda Thomas. I'm the Senior Sales Consultant and Marketing Liaison um, with Care Patrol servicing Montgomery and Howard County. And I am thrilled to be here today as well. Great. And, and then next on my little Brady Bunch thing is Amy. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Fager, and I service the beautiful Maryland Eastern Shore and also um, counties in Delaware. And um, just very happy to be here. And I'm glad to see so many people joining us today. Please uh, tell all your friends and neighbors about our great programs that we have to offer. Thank you. Great. And then uh, Cindy, just uh, remind everybody again what territories you cover. I have part of Baltimore County that bumps up against Paula and then Anne Arundel County. Great. And then the next one I've got on my screen is Star Sowers. Hello, I'm Star Sowers. I work with Bonnie Danker in Howard and Montgomery County. So it's good to see everybody today. Thanks and for then, coming. Great. And then uh, above to the right is Charles <laughs> Picard. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Picard, and I work in Prince George's County for Care Patrol and parts of Charles County as well. So we get to know our communities in the areas, and our goal is to get the best match for our prospective residents. Nice to see everybody today. Great. And then I've got Bonnie Danker. Good afternoon. I'm Bonnie. I have Howard and Montgomery counties, and we also go into the district. Um, Great to be with you all here today. Uh, thank you so much for coming out and attending this. Please give us some feedback on your experience. We'd like to know how you're enjoying these programs. And if there's anything else that you think that we can um, <coughs> offer to meet your needs, we, we wanna be here to do that. In addition to our niche, which is senior housing and living, um, we also have many other wonderful providers um, who are part of our network. And many times we can help move you along in your journey through connecting you with some of our additional resources. So we welcome that opportunity to help you care manage. And then I've got Robin Edwards, and then we'll go to the center square with uh, Bonnie Elliott, but uh, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robin. I, I am the owner of Care Patrol of Northern Virginia. 
serving Fairfax, Arlington, and uh, Alexandria and part of Prince William County. And I just want to welcome everyone. Thank you. Excellent. And our last but not least, Bonnie Elliott, Center Square. What was that? <laughs> One of those game shows. Bonnie number two. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks for um, helping us put the pieces of elder care together. I uh, am Bonnie Elliott, and I cover Carroll, Frederick, and Washington counties in Maryland, and Loudoun County, Virginia, and a little bit of um, southern, western Virginia, like toward Front Royal, Winchester, if we need to. We can, Robin and I both um, have helped folks out there. So thank Great. you for coming. All right. And before we meet Dr. Dixon, I want to bring Jason Hafer on, who is the partner with uh, Care Patrol this month from Home Centrist Healthcare. And uh, Jason, let's see, are, are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and uh, Jason, you want to tell the audience a little bit about um, Home Centrist? Sure, thanks. Uh, so first off, just super excited to be able to have this opportunity. I want to thank my friends at Care Patrol for inviting us to, uh, to be a sponsor today. Uh, home Centris is an integrated solutions provider. We provide home-based solutions across the state of Maryland. Primarily, those solutions involve personal care services in the home, skilled home health services in the home, as well as visiting primary care, so kind of the old-fashioned house calls type programs. We have five offices across the state, stretching from the Eastern Shore to Western Maryland. We, uh, we really pride ourselves on being able to, to be a solutions driver for individuals who are in the community and, and having day-to-day -day challenges. When we are not able to provide the solutions directly in-house, we have a, a, a uh, list of trusted community partners that we work with to ensure that we're able to continue to meet the needs of the community. And we're just, again, really excited to be here, excited to be able to be a sponsor. And uh, I'm excited to hear what Dr. Dixon has to say. So I'm going to shut up now. Well, well before we do that, we've got a, a fun little uh, addition to this, uh, this month's um, event. And that is uh, Jason and uh, the Home Centrist team has donated a door prize. Uh, and what, what do we have on the prize today? So we have, I don't know if it's, it's kind of a little small, I have, a, I have a large basket full of stress relieving goodies, everything from chocolate and, and lattes and, and lap blankets and um, just kind of everything in between. There's also a gift card in there for anything I might have missed along the way. Wow. <laughs> That's great. So uh, Jason, if you want to uh, spin the virtual wheel of names, I've loaded all the names who are, we have 125 people that registered. So hopefully the winner is in the audience. Uh, so go ahead and spin the wheel. All right, here we go. And then we will give Jason the email address for the winner who is Sandra Wilson. And uh, I wonder if Sandra, oh, Sandra is in the audience. So this is awesome. So um, uh, I will make sure to give uh, your email to Jason, Sandra, and uh, you get that great, great prize. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to place my contact information in the chat box. So anybody who has any questions or, or Sandra, anybody who wants to reach out to me, please feel free. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place all my contact information there in the chat for everybody. Thanks so much. Great. Okay. And uh, so with that, uh, I am going to bring on um, our speaker today and uh, apologize for being a little stuck here in um, Zoom, Dr. Asante Dixon. So uh, let's see, let me bring Dr. Dixon on. And uh, doc, Dr. Dixon, it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I want to uh, specifically uh, thank Rhonda Thomas for inviting me through 
your system and um, hopefully we can get some information out to everybody in the next 30 minutes. Yeah, and um, so, you know, Dr. Dixon, as many of you know, is the chairman of radiology at Adventist Healthcare White Oak Medical Center. And he's also the president and co-founder of Ascension Medical Educators. But uh, Dr. Dixon, before we jump into your program, yeah. give us a little bit about your background and what, what led you to this career path? So, um, uh, I am originally from New York, um, grew up uh, mostly in Long Island, Freeport, South Shore. Um, my parents uh, were educators. My father uh, was everything librarian, media specialist, uh, and anything else in education he could do. My mother is a PhD in um, education and just recently retired from Uniondale School District in Long Island after near 46 or 47 years of work there. I grew up uh, as a child from an immigrant family and saw a lot of medical you know, people in my family and decided I wanted to pursue medicine. Uh, went to Cornell for undergrad, Georgetown for medical school, Georgetown for internship, uh, Stony Brook Winthrop in Long Island for residency in radiology. And then I did my last two years of neuroradiology fellowship training uh, at Stanford University. And actually something interesting that you guys, some of you will, uh, you'll probably respond differently, but when I was at Stanford, uh, 2005 to 2007, doing my last two years, my neuro section chief and my teacher, my mentor who taught me everything I know about the brain and the spine was Scott Atlas. And those of you who have been following politics for the past four years, Scott Atlas was the president's uh, medical advisor. And I'll just leave that there before the yeah. chair starts flying. But medically, he's a genius. Politically, that's up to you guys. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, this is great, and um, uh, we're thrilled to have you. So I'm going to drop off the screen, and if you want to share your screen uh, and, and share your resources, I want to remind the audience that you can ask questions by just probably the best way is to just type them into the Q&A box whenever they come to your mind, and um, then at once uh, Dr. Dixon is through his slides, uh, you can raise your hand and verbally uh, ask a question, but um, uh, take it away, Dr. Dixon. Okay, so um, the next 30 minutes, let's do 30 minutes, and then if there are any questions afterward, we can address them. But um, like Steve said, if you have any questions, concerns, agreements, disagreements, feel free to either text, chat, or just speak up and Steve will uh, help me um, kind of address you directly. So um, what we're gonna talk about for the next 30 minutes is something that everybody needs to pay attention to because we're all living the same challenging road right now, which is dealing with stress and trauma. Stress and trauma, and those are two words that we're gonna define because people use them with all kinds of definitions. And then we're going to try to associate it with how does stress and trauma really affect our brains? So what is trauma? So the definition is going to be anything from physical injury to emotional shock that a person is going to feel after a stressful or physical injury. Okay. A deeply distressing or disturbing experience is defined as trauma. Stress is defined as a physical, chemical, or emotional factor that causes bodily, bodily um, repercussions, okay? And I want to stress that we'll be talking about this later, which is that stress and trauma have been linked to disease, okay? And I want you to pay attention to that because this is why we all want to figure out how are we going to deal with our stresses and our traumatic intakes, because we are placing ourselves at risk 
for disease. It's here. Okay. So, stress. Stress is something that evolutionarily came about in order to keep us alive. It's really a response that our bodies have in an effort to cope with potentially serious or dangerous situations. What your body does is it releases hormones that will increase your heart rate and get your muscles ready to respond to action. So you've all heard of fight or flight. What is the fight or flight mechanism? So let's talk from a medical aspect, but we're gonna talk in a level that everybody can understand. So your brain here, you have hair, right? Then your scalp, then under your scalp, you've got your cranium, which is the bone, and inside of that bone is your brain. That's the central nervous system. That's where all the computations occur. And in there, there's a part of your brain called the hypothalamus. And there's no quiz on this, there's no test, so you don't have to worry if you don't remember what the hypothalamus is, but just follow me. The hypothalamus in your brain is going to send hormones instantaneously from here down into, a, on, the top of your, on the top of your kidneys, which are your adrenal glands, and your adrenal glands are then gonna contract and they're going to secrete hormones into your blood. Your blood is going to take those hormones to every part of your body, but specifically they're gonna be, be taken up into your heart, your lungs, and your muscles, okay? And that's why uh, 50,000 years ago when you were walking down a dirt path, and you saw a huge saber-toothed tiger jump out in front of you, your hypothalamus immediately secreted these hormones and your muscles and your heart then began to prepare you to either fight this saber-toothed tiger or turn into Jesse Owens and run like all heck, right? So this is an evolutionary response that we all have within us and it, it was derived to keep us alive. So take a look at this. What I've given you here is on the left, what I've done is I've taken your brain and I've cut right down the center of your brain like a slice of bread. And then I've turned your head to the side. And in this case, it's this side actually. So I've sliced you here and I've turned you to the side. So this is the front of your brain. This is the back of your brain, okay? And for those of you who like imagery, I've actually had an image here of an MRI of your brain. So as you, let's see. All right. As you scroll through your brain, you can see that your brain is a three-dimensional organ. Let's see. So there. So on the left of your screen, you actually have what we call a gross section of your brain. On the right, this is an image of an MRI of the brain. So front, eyes, nose, and back of the head, all right? Your hypothalamus is gonna sit right in here, right in here. So this is the nerve center that's gonna describe and is going to be the gatekeeper for your stress response. Let's talk about COVID-19. All of us are dealing with COVID-19. I can't think of anybody in the world who's not. So this is a strain of coronavirus. We're all familiar with these terms by now. First described in China in 2019, hence the name coronavirus 19, 2019. It comes from a large family of viruses. And those of us who were paying attention to the media years ago, do you remember SARS and MERS? Well, they're all family right? On Thanksgiving, they're all sitting there together, right? Some are at the kiddie table, some are at the adult table, but they're all family of viruses that we're dealing with. What gives you an increased risk of susceptibility from COVID-19? Well, if you have any or all of things like diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, obesity, sickle cell disease, and the list goes on and on, these, what we call pre-existing conditions, 
make your likelihood of getting COVID disease and being symptomatic higher, okay? Now let's be clear, this does not mean it increases your risk of getting COVID disease. It just increases your risk of if you were to get COVID, you may be sicker. Here is a brief chart I gave from the CDC to show you that there is a direct relationship between your chance of being really sick and dying from COVID and age, okay? So this is not here to scare anybody, but I'm trying to give some science to put this disease in perspective. There's a whole lot of information out there and it's easy to get confused. Here's another image of the brain. And what I've done here is I've sliced the bread this way and I've ripped the top of your brain off and I'm showing you the brain from the top down, okay? Here, I've sliced the bread like this and I've ripped your face off and now you're looking into the brain, okay? So from here, you can see that your brain again is a three-dimensional organ. There are your eyes. And as we come back, your hypothalamus is going to be right in here. So I've shown you now the brain from this direction, this direction, and now looking straight on. Okay, now we've got the neurology and the neuroanatomy under control. Let's talk about emotions. Okay, so emotions are very, very, very important as we discuss stress and as we discuss dealing with stress. So for example, when you are joyous, and you're curious, you are more likely to harness attention and you're more likely to engage with people and conversations. When you elicit feelings of fear and anxiety, it absolutely disrupts your concentration and can absolutely can interfere with your thinking. So think about anytime you're at work or if you're at home or, or you could be out at a social event uh, or talking to somebody on the phone and somebody's saying something to you, but you keep thinking about a stressful event that you may have had earlier in the day. What happens? You have to say to the person, I I'm sorry, did you say something? Why? Because those hormones that are responding to the stressful thought that you're having is actually interrupting your ability to actually absorb and process information. Chronic stress is nothing more than stress that persists. So when your heart rate and your lungs respond to the saber-toothed tiger, when the saber-toothed tiger walks away and says he doesn't wanna eat you because he's found something else to eat, Normally, your heart rate should reduce, your breathing should come back to normal, and your muscles should release the blood, and it should now go back to the other organs. But for you, that stress continues. So you are now having elevated heart rate, elevated breathing, even when the stressful, the stressful insider has gone away. And many of us right now, given COVID, we are living with this stress every single day, whether we're walking around in the daytime, talking to our loved ones, visiting loved ones, or in our inability to visit loved ones, or we're sleeping. We're walking around with this stress response. Okay, emotions matter when it comes to making decisions. So let's talk about hijacking, okay? Hijacking is not just made for cars or planes, but our brains hijack our emotions and our thought processes. So let's talk about, this is a brief overview of how stimuli, which would be vision, smell, taste, hearing, how they're processed in your brain. So there's a picture here of an eyeball. Let's see the eyeball sees a saber-toothed tiger. That eyeball then sends that information to the big yellow part of your brain, which is called the thalamus. And then through a series of circuits that we won't go over now, it goes back to your amygdala, which is this red circle. And the amygdala now is actually going to assist in processing this information. The difference between an appropriate stress response and an unchecked stress response is that the amygdala is the processing center 
that takes over your brain when it smells trouble. And the response from the amygdala is instantaneous. It will hijack your brain and prevent the normal process loop from occurring. And we'll go over this so you understand what I'm saying. So in about the mid 1990s, the term amygdala hijack was coined. And essentially this states that rather than you being able to process information at your leisure and rationally, your amygdala takes over the response and makes you into places you into a fight or fight or flight mechanism response instantaneously, whether appropriate or inappropriately. And you're not able to process like a normal rational person. So when you elicit positive states, okay, and what I put here as look good, feel good, right? you will be able to more favorably deal with stress response, more favorably be able to deal with people, your family, and even this crazy milieu that we're living in now, which is the COVID pandemic, okay? Your mental flexibility, your creativity can be harnessed with pleasant emotions. Why? Because when you're thinking of pleasantry, you're essentially preventing that amygdala hijack that is only there to make you listen to a news report that states that somebody died from COVID or how many thousands or hundreds of people died from COVID. And you immediately think the worst that you're gonna die tomorrow. And the person that you spoke to on the phone today passed COVID through the phone and you potentially may get COVID, right? So positive imagery and your emotions make a huge difference in how you process stress. Relationships. We are all dealing right now in this pandemic with abnormal relationships. People are at home together for extended period of time, extended periods of time because the world, the outside world, as we say, is closed because of shutdowns. Family members are not able to get together like accustomed because elderly patients Elderly family members, elderly friends may be in facilities that are closely guarding the health and welfare of those people, and they're preventing family members from interacting with them. That means that we're relying a lot on technology. We're relying a lot on phone and FaceTiming and Zooming. But I want to tell you that when you are able to regulate your emotions, you are able to improve the quality of relationships that you're having even in this trying time because people are paying attention to what? Your facial expressions, your body language, your tone, your behavior. I'm sure you've been on the phone with loved ones in the past eight, nine months and somebody says, you know, you sound upset. And you say, no, I'm not upset. And they say, well, you sound upset. Or why are you making that face? Well, I can tell you that face is adding to a stress response of the person on the other end of the phone or the other end of the Zoom. You need to be able to regulate your emotions because it's having a direct effect on the people that you're talking to, whether it be your family or even your colleagues at work. Emotions matter for your well being, okay? Your ability to regulate stress and unpleasant emotions play a direct role in your ability to foster resilience during traumatic events. Your performance. Chronic stress leads to burnout. Here in the hospital, normally, even before this pandemic, hospital and healthcare workers they have to face increased or higher levels of burnout because of chronic stress, the stress of seeing sick people over and over and over and over, and the pace, it leads to burnout. Now with COVID on top of it, hospital workers are seeing massively elevated rates of chronic stress and burnout. You, in your respective areas of work, home, family, and life, 
you are experiencing diminishing quality of relationships if you're not dealing with your chronic stress. That amygdala is in there firing and keeping you in this fight or flight saber tooth tiger uh, presentation 24 hours a day. So how can that, how can that really negate your chances of living a healthy next week, next month, next year, or next decade? Well, how about we talk about your system's response to stress? So if you maintain an abnormal blood pressure, because you're constantly having amygdala hijack to watching the news or listening to your son or daughter who's always kind of talk talking about, you know, how bad they think the pandemic is or how bad the day at work was, you yourself can increase your chances of experiencing stroke or heart attack. Okay. Oftentimes stress leads to muscle pain, body tension which can then lead to headache and headache chronicity, sexual dysfunction, menopause, and those women who are in the age, menopause by itself is tough enough. With chronic stress, your menopause symptoms can be worsened. Ulcers, we see people with ulcerations, uh, reflux disease, constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, elevated stress hormones for a persistent amount of time can lead to virus and bacterial susceptibility. You can get sick more easily when you're chronically stressed. So here, let's talk back and forth for a minute. So tell me, how do you manifest stress? So I want some people to give me some examples, right? How does stress manifest itself within you. So go ahead and even speak up or chat, but let's talk to each other about this because if you can't recognize the stress, there's no way you're gonna be able to deal with it. So um, if you wanna just either type it into chat or Q and A, um, you could also raise your hand and uh, I'll bring you on audio. Um, Belinda says lack of sleep. Rhonda says changes in my body. Um, Meredith says, I do Sudoku puzzles. Keisha says, I can't sleep. Okay. And, um, and, and uh, let's see, stop, uh, Sybil says, stop eating. Ernestine says, overeating. Uh, Gwendolyn says, not being able to touch people you love. Amy eats junk food. Charles says, inability to relax. Myrtle says, constipation. Glenda, racing heartbeats. Mary, constant worrying. Okay. And um, you know, Dr. Dixon, uh, before I think we'll get a few more, but uh, Casey had a question earlier in your presentation. And, sure. Uh, and, and Casey asks, is there any difference between stress and panic or could it be called a stress attack instead of a panic attack? So that's a great question. So stress, and panic, they're interchangeable, kind of like a metronome. They're not exactly the same, but they can overlap each other depending on the circumstance. So one can have a stress response or be stressed, okay, which can then bring on a panic attack, okay? So stress, as we stated, is a normal evolutionary, normal evolutionary response to uh, stimuli or thoughts. A panic attack is essentially a stress attack that then can combine itself with some historical memory um, inputs, if you will, that can then bring you along a process where your stress response cannot be controlled. So that heart rate, heavy breathing, sweating. Now, instead of you just working and still being functional at your job, but you're just stressed or you're at home and you just can't relax and you can't sleep. Now, 
that heart rate and heavy breathing essentially has you clutching your chest because it has overcompensated for this response and now you can't function at all. So a panic attack means you cannot function. You're not working. You're not having normal relationships. You've dropped the phone because you can no longer hold the phone. That's the difference between a stress response and a panic attack. Does that make sense? Yeah, People yeah, that can was really function good. with stress response. But when they have a panic attack, they're essentially incapacitated. Make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. And while you were explaining that, we had a couple more stress reactions come in. Bonnie's short-tempered and Megan gets stomach problems. And I think I think we covered all of them. So in general, if you think of all of the responses that people gave, right? So from lack of sleep to constipation to uh, what was the other one? Uh, 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 what was this? Uh, constipation, stomach problems, lack of sleep. Give me some others that people said. Whoops, sorry. Um, short tempered, constant worrying, racing heartbeats, right. eating junk food, inability okay. to relax. Short, temp short tempered. Uh, racing heartbeat, all right? Think about this. So if you 50,000 years ago were walking down a path and we'll change the animal, a huge python, 36 feet was in front of you and it raised its head, head and it started to you know, do the hissing sound. You would have all of those symptoms in a third of a millisecond, your heart would start to race. And if I turned to you and I said, hey, Steve, I know that Python is about to eat you, but I'm wondering if you want this hamburger because <laughs> it's really juicy. Your response would be, what hamburger? I have no desire to eat anything right now, right? Because the blood supply to your bowel has been completely shut down. Your blood supply has gone to your muscles because you're ready to run. So people who are having constipation during stress, right? Abdominal pain, ulcers, that's because you're constantly in this fight or flight um, milieu in your body where you're not looking to eat. Now, there are people that when they're stressed, they eat more, but they're not eating more because of a pure pathophysiologic stimulus to eat. That is, there is another route in the brain that is looking to deal or cope with stress by eating because eating makes you feel good. Stress makes you feel bad. So the overeating is a compensatory mechanism to try to make you feel better for the stress response. Okay, any other questions or should I go on? I think we're, I think we're, uh, yeah, I think we're good. Okay, so I'm cognizant of the time, so let's move. Coping mechanisms. So I made up this mnemonic and I use it, it's called SLAP, okay? So whenever you're feeling stressed, you need to start to slap yourself, right? And this is not uh, literally, it's figuratively, but if you need to literally, hey, that's your business and whatever you need to do to get the job done, we will accept. So it is stop, listen to yourself, adjust your thinking and practically apply. So stop, literally, sometimes I, when I'm, when I'm thinking about something I can't get out of my head, I have to literally say out loud, stop, okay? Listen to yourself, listen how irrational you are. Adjust your thinking and then practically apply. All right, so how do we do this? We do this by acceptance, all right? The first step in recovery is accepting that you have an issue. Accepting that that issue is affecting your ability to function. You can't recover if you don't accept that you have an issue. Desensitization, which means that intermittently you may have to think about those stressors that are stressing you. That's the way you're going to learn to deal and desensitize, is to constantly re-immerse yourself in those stressors. But when the amygdala jumps you and hijacks your brain to start panicking, you must start to think through it. Stop, listen, okay? 
reprocess the way you're thinking about the stressor. You must restructure the way you are responding to stress, your habits. So if you're watching the news and you're sitting there just going from CNN to Fox News to MSNBC to whatever, and all you're listening to is how many people died today of COVID? How many people got infected? How many positive tests? How many hospitals are overrun? You need to restructure that habit and start to maybe say to yourself, maybe I need to stop listening to all of these media outlets that are basically here to make money, let's be honest. And if they're talking about flowers and the good that people are doing in your community every day, they're not gonna get any ratings. So maybe you need to think about what you're watching, how much you're watches, watching and how to process this information. Reduce your stress and you must face your fears. And lastly, as my mother would always say, time heals. Right? So with time of you practicing all of these mechanisms, you can learn to deal with stress and recover your own sanity and improve the relationships of your colleagues and your loved ones. All right. Correlation of positivity. All right. This is more of the same. And I'm showing this by showing myself here doing a procedure. When I first started placing big needles and trocars like I am here in this gentleman's back into his spine, I had a stress response. All I could think about was, oh my God, what if I hit the spinal cord and I paralyze him? What if I hit an artery and then I bleed into his spinal cord and then I bleed him out and then I paralyze him, right? But with time, with training, right? Just like we do in medical school and postgraduate and fellowship and attending, we train, train, train to put our minds in a situation where we can deal with dangerous and stressful situations, but still be in control. You need to practice doing that in your respective lives. More training to be able to do surgery, right? That's my wife to the left. Training so that when things start squirting, you don't panic and run out of the room screaming with your arms you know, swaying above your head, training, right? As you're thinking of things, you need to say, how did I think about that? And you need to repeat it because it was successful. Repeat it because it was successful. You need to retrain your brain, take the amygdala hijack and suppress it. What does stress look like to you? We discussed that, right? So in general, what we've discussed in the past 30, two minutes, all right, I'm a little over, is we've talked about what's the evolutionary basis of stress? Why do we have stress, right? Why would your body need stress, right? We've talked about that, we've answered it. We've talked about your brain and essentially we've gone through medical school in 32 minutes. You know where the brain is situated within your cranium, within your skull. We know where the amygdala and the hypothalamus are, which is where my two fingers intersect. We know that they are there to protect you, but when not regulated properly, they overstimulate your stress response and they can either make you function poorly or as somebody asked, panic where you cannot function at all, right? And then we've talked about mechanisms by which you need to retrain your brain and suppress your brain from incapacitating you because it essentially is mind over matter. No matter how many people say, oh, it's not mind over matter, it's mind over matter, okay? And we talked about how stress looks for you individually. And then we explained how your stress responses are actually physiological. There's a reason why you stress the way you stress because you're constantly in a panic mentally, where you're constantly preparing yourself to either fight or run, okay? So very fast, very quick, very dirty, but I hope this was helpful so that when we get off of this talk today, what you need to do is not just think about the lecture and how nice it was to just be able to stare at yet another Zoom lecture, but 
think about how you are going to be able to improve your life, improve your relationships with your friends, your colleagues, and your loved ones, and how are you going to prevent yourself from coming through the emergency room in another week, month, or decade and laying on my table with a stroke or bleeding. And then now I've got to treat you. And really this was preventable because it was secondary to an inability to deal and deregulate chronic stress. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions or right. everybody's well, good? First off, um, this was excellent. And uh, I, I echo Mayor the statement that this is very interesting and it was very refreshing to hear the voice of a fellow Long Islander, especially a brilliant gentleman who can make a medical school class so understandable. I, I echo that. This really is probably one of the best presentations I've heard on stress. And uh, the, um, Let's see, so we've got some time, folks. If you wanna make a question or a comment for Dr. Dixon, um, you could raise your hand by pressing the, doc, the raise your hand button and, uh, or you can type one in like Gwendolyn has. And Gwendolyn says, Dr. Dixon, I can do 99% of the things right throughout the day, but if it's just 1% of something happens to make me feel stressed that day, I feel out of source and in inadequate for hours and sometimes for days. It's very hard for me to let it go. How do I learn to shake that 1% off sooner? I'm a perfectionist. I want everything to fit neatly in a box and it's hard for me to let negativity go. Okay, so. Firstly, I want to let you know that I have the same problem. You and I have the same disease, right? Um, I always used to say that, you know, if one of my fingers gets jammed, I have, I have a lot of trouble still functioning my whole hand because all I'm focused on is this one finger that got jammed, even though I've got four remaining functional fingers, right? Some people are still good at working with the four remaining fingers, but I'm stuck on this one, right? You and I are the same. What you need to do is you need to slap yourself, all right? <laughs> you really need to literally say, stop. Some people can say stop silently. If you're like me, I literally have to say it aloud. I need to say, stop, Dixon, stop. I need to hear my voice, right? And then what I need to do is try to redirect my thoughts and process my thoughts in a way where I say, okay, you are perseverating. You keep thinking about the same thing. This is an outcome that has either already occurred or you do or you don't have control over it. And I start to analyze, why am I actually stressing over this? Is there another opportunity for me to address a person or a thing that has me thinking this way? If not, then I need to start saying, I need to restructure the way I'm thinking. Now, here's what's important. Anybody who tells you that you only have to do that once is lying. You may have to do that another 150 times, but each time you slap yourself and literally at work or wherever you are at home, I don't care if somebody says, I'm sorry, uh, were you talking to me? And I'm like, no, nah, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to myself, right? And then five minutes later, you may have to say, stop. Take yourself through the same process, restructure. And then what happens is five minutes turns into 10 minutes. 10 minutes turns into an hour. An hour turns into six hours. And then in another week, you may say, man, I haven't been perseverating over that thing in three days. And then three days turns to eight days. And then you've learned the technique that the next stressor that comes that wants to be that 1% that takes over your mind, you have a process and a pathway to deal with it. Because as you all know, nobody is gonna have one stress in their life. It just seems like they just keep coming new and fresh out of a car manufacturer plant every single day. It's something new. So you need a technique to address it. Does that answer your question? I didn't see. I, I think that did based on the comments. And um, 
we've got Peggy who's got her hand raised. And while Peggy is uh, unmuting herself, Lucille Hall, not Lucille Ball, says, better able to recognize and handle my stressors or recognize them faster. Um, the, uh, and that relates to Mary Beth May says, will this be like muscle memory the more we do it? That's correct. It, it is like muscle memory. And just like a muscle, if you practice your slap mechanism for the next month, you will find your muscle to be strong and highly resistant. Your endurance will be incredible. But the minute you stop exercising your brain muscle of slap mechanism, what happens? Your amygdala takes over again and puts a gun inside your brain and says, time to panic. You know we like to panic, so let's panic, right? That's what happens. You stop running, you can't run as fast the next time. You can't run as long the next time because it was like disuse atrophy. Your brain is the same way. You stop slap mechanism, mechanisming yourself and your amygdala is gonna take over and say, we like to panic. We like to party, we like to panic, right? <laughs> so you have to keep it going. Great. Uh, Peggy, I think your audio is working now. Is it for me? Yep. Did you I'm have a here, question? Uh, I think I generally have anxiety handled just fine. My son works in the Capitol. This recent event has really toppled me into panic. I am scared to death all the time. Why? Why can I not get over seeing those people climbing the wall and being aware of my sons inside that building? Okay, so your stressor, right? And if there are any- um... Has the COVID, I feel as though the COVID has played into all this, being isolated, not with people. So, okay. So if there are any psychiatrists, psychologists in the room, you'll know that this is what we, what we in medicine, we refer to as an identifiable stressor. You have an identifiable stressor. And that identifiable stressor was watching the events that we all watched. Uh, what are today is... Uh, today's Tuesday. So last Wednesday or last Thursday. Right. 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 So that's your identifiable stressor. Right. But the identifiable stressor is sitting on top of another identifiable stressor, which is you've been isolated like the whole world from COVID-19 pandemic. Correct. Right. You put those things together and your second identifiable stressor elicits an amygdala response within you that is even greater than it would have been had that event occurred outside of a pandemic. Correct. Right, so- I can rationalize all that, but I don't like my reaction. I don't like putting my two hands up and seeing them shaking. Okay, so again, the way, and again, we are literally having a conversation here that I can only give you kind of like a $50,000 response <laughs> Um, I can't give you a million dollar response because we would need to actually have like a session together because you have information that you don't need to share with the rest of us that we would really need to know to really give you the detailed tools to deal with your individual situation. But what I can tell you again is you need every time you think of that event that happened last week and every time you think of your son that's in that building. A combination I would suggest. One is, hopefully you have a relationship with him where you can talk to him regularly and you can hear his voice and know that he is safe. And two, you need to slap yourself on a regular basis, repeatedly, to reprocess your thoughts as to why you're essentially fixated on the events that occurred last week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I know you're going to say, oh, that doesn't help me individually. I need more help. But this is why we're having these talks is because if not ability for you to help yourself, this is an opportunity for people to realize I need help. And there are people out there that they specialize 
in their own brand of slap mechanism that assists you in working through this process because it's not a process that you can place uh, today at one o'clock and then by two o'clock today, you're calling us and saying, I'm great. This is a work in progress for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> great, thank you for the great question, Peggy. And, and uh, you'll get through this, I know you will. Um, and you know, that brings, you are just a, an amazing, wealth of resources, Dr. Dixon. Can you tell us, like, how, do, how does your practice help? Can, can you help uh, individuals and families dive deeper through your practice? So uh, my clinical training is in neuro, so that is brain and spine, but I am primarily a brain and spine mechanic. Right? So that means when you have an aneurysm and it ruptures, when you have a stroke and you need help uh, treating the stroke, when you've got a disc bulge or herniation and you need help, uh, when you've got cancer, I treat the cancer. Um, what I am sharing with you is a combination of my own personal interest combined with my training because brain is brain, right? And also, um, I have affiliations with those services that work with thinking, processing, and I can assist people. If, you, if you, you're interested, we can take this offline and maybe we can, uh, if people need help, we can create a pipeline where we can start, uh, Steve, through your, um, through your services, we can, we can help people get the help that they need. Well, that's, the that I know that would help a lot of people. Well, it, we've got one more question and it's it's one minute past one, but uh, Casey Bowser says, does physical stress take a higher priority in your brain than mental stress? Is that why exercise is such a good activity to help with stress? Okay, so um, let's define the terms, physical and mental, okay? Uh, now, again, this is America, so people can argue all day over terms, so we have to be very careful. Physical stress, I'm assuming what you mean by that is uh, uh, maybe uh, you being injured by something. Uh, mental stress may be maybe an interaction you had with somebody that did not go according to plan. Oh, okay. just... Here, here she, she elaborated, uh, getting hit by the Python instead of just seeing a Python. Okay, all right, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm only smiling because I can only think of the different ways people can use those terms, but no, um, they're no different in terms of how your brain responds to it, okay? Thinking about getting eaten or bitten by the python is just as deleterious to your functioning as actually being in the python situation. That's why when people dream about things, like if you're dreaming about the python, that's why people wake up startled, sweating, they feel their heart beating through their chest, right? And if you bust it in the door at that time and you're like, hey, would you like this whopper? Right? They'll say, what whopper? What are you talking about? I have no desire to eat right now. I can barely breathe, right? That is the same response you would have if the Python was physically in your room, no different. So physical stress and mental stress, your amygdala responds the same way. That's why your brain is so powerful because the imagery that your brain keeps is just, just, just as focused as the physical interaction that you may have had a year ago, 10 years ago, or 50 years ago. Wow. Man, well, this has been an amazing presentation, uh, Dr. Dixon. I, I, I know the comments are fantastic. Uh, you really explained a very challenging thing in a in a very easy to understand way. And um, I, I know myself, Care Patrol, Care Centrist, Home Centrist are all thrilled that you were able to uh, participate with us today. Um, for everybody, 
we're, we recorded this. We'll provide you with a copy of the chat. Um, Dr. Dixon, is it okay if I share your PowerPoint as a PDF? Yeah, sure, no problem. Okay, great. Uh, you had a lot of requests for that. And, um, uh, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll share your office's contact info in case somebody would like to get in touch with you. Yes. Um, uh, can you please use my Ascension email? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, have a great day, everybody. And I hope we can get out there and practice slapping ourselves uh, when we yeah. run into those stressful situations. Right. And I leave you all to say, remember, um, that's, that's the most important thing, right? Uh, slap yourself. <laughs> slap yourself, right? For all kinds of reasons, it's best if you slap yourself. <laughs> I love it. Thank All right, you so thank you, much. everybody. Thank you. Okay, bye bye.